Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Bellevue Heights Church, where the weather is cool, the snacks are wonderful, and the friends are fabulous. So glad you're here. Welcome tonight. We're delighted you're here. When you came in, as you always do, you received a connection card. That connection card allows you to let us know that you were here, and there's a lot of different uses for that connection card. Every once in a while, I run into somebody who doesn't have a name tag. We want you to have a name tag. We want you to, if you have a prayer request that you'd like to provide and share with us, we'd invite you to do that. If you have, uh, like to meet, visit, visit with a pastor, reach out to us and let us know and we'll contact you. At any rate, the connection card is of great value in remaining connected. We let you know during the week all kinds of uh, information with your email address that's taking place here at Bellevue Heights Church. So, fill it out if you would please, if you're with us for, for the first time, we're really happy you're here. Those connection cards go into the giving kiosk at each door on your way out with tithes and offerings, whatever you may have brought with you to be a part of your worship here at Bellevue Heights Church. Now I have several announcements that I want to share with you tonight. If you might, you might pull out your worship folder just kind of to glance through as I'm reviewing them with you. We have the New Beginnings Bible Study with Pastor Rob. That continues on Tuesday at 10 o'clock in Franklin Hall. Well attended, there's still time for you to join and enjoy learning a lot. Then, Season 2 of The Chosen on Thursday at 1 p.m. Season 2 of The Chosen. And uh, it's been well attended. You can still come in and enjoy part of Season 2. And um, it's a wonderful time and it's nice and cool in here then too. Then. At the ministry table tonight, you have, we have women's ministry with Camp BH. Sign up today for Camp BHC Ladies Edition on Thursday, August 17th. There were two lovely representatives from women's ministry there tonight. They'll be there afterwards. Ladies, stop by, sign up. And then they also are taking sign up for prayer partners. So we invite you for that as well. BHC Summer Picnic, Tuesday, Wednesday, this week. It is going to be a wonderful evening. We invite you to sign up tonight on the connection card. Let us know how many are coming, one or, one or the other of those two nights. We invite you to bring friends and neighbors. If you can't sign up tonight, just call the church office. Let us know how, we're, how many are coming. We're preparing for about 200 each night. It's going to be a wonderful evening with hot dogs and potato salad and baked beans. And I can just keep going on. But... It will only happen if you come. So we invite you to sign up tonight. That's two there. Well, she's, I have a picture right here of her. And she is going to provide us one of her phenomenal comedian characters. And uh, it's going to be a great evening, great food fellowship. And you're going to laugh and digest all that food in your laughing. Back to school weekend. Next, next Saturday and Sunday. Phoenix Christian Preparatory School are our guests. They're going to be with us that weekend. And you saw at the table, we have boxes ready to receive uh, whatever you might be able to bring regarding school supplies, and we invite you to do that. That's next week. Pastor Rob is continuing uh, the movement and collecting. Uh, well, he's not. He's got lots of help in the office that are helping with this. But we have October 1 through 11, 2024, 11 day steps, 11 day steps of St. Paul Greece tour. For information, check with the office. You have a whole year ahead of you, but you need to plan now. I think that they think maybe 45 people might be able to go. And so people are already signing up. So we want you to give that some thought. Pictures are being taken this weekend, again by Ginny Carlson. We want you in our online directory. If we haven't taken your pictures, maybe this is the night. We'd love to have your picture to enhance our directory. And then a new summer Bible, a new Bible study beginning Thursday, August 3rd at 6 p.m. with Dan Best on 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. That's August, August 3rd at 6 p.m., which is a Thursday. And so we want you to sign up in the forum. You'll see a table for that as well. Well, once again, we're so glad you're here tonight. That was 10 announcements. I thought we'd take a break, and I'll have you give you the other 10 in just a few minutes. I'm teasing. We only have 10 tonight. Pastor Randy, we haven't come for announcements. We've come to worship, so let's worship. All right. All right. Thank you, Pastor Dave. It's July, which means I'm thinking about back to school, and I'm thinking about Christmas. 
And years ago, the, it reminded me of a story. Years ago, the Sunday School Times carried the account of a Christian school for the children of the untouchables in India. This is prior to World War II. And each year, the children received Christmas presents from children in England. And the girls would get a doll, and, and the boys would get a toy. And on one occasion, the doctor from a nearby mission hospital was asked to distribute these gifts. And in the course of his visit, he told the youngsters about a village where the boys and girls had never heard about Jesus. And he suggested that maybe they would like to give them some of their old toys as presents. And they liked that idea, and they, they readily agreed. And a week later, the doctor returned to collect the gifts, and the sight was unforgettable. One by one, the children filed and handed the doctor a doll or a toy, and to his great surprise, they had all given the new presents they had just received for Christmas a few days earlier. And when he asked why, a little girl spoke up. He says, I think about what God did by giving us Jesus. Could we give him less than our best? And I'm, I'm talking to myself and sometimes I ask, am I giving my best to God? And I don't believe Jesus calls us to give up, you know, things that we don't have to give up or he doesn't call us to perform beyond our abilities or to share beyond what we've been given, but he does call us to draw near to him and to abide with him and to serve him and to honor him and to give him our very best. Because when we give our best, people are gonna see his love and his grace and his mercy and people are gonna see and hear and know about Jesus. So I want to invite you to stand with us as we give him our very best in worship.
worth a thing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. Let Silence, the roaring 
lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is a victory. Oh, hallelujah. Scripture tonight is Psalm chapter 11. In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain, for behold the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see. His eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur and a scorching Wind shall be the portion of their cup, for the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. about you, Jesus. 
can ask for. All I have is yours. Every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within. Through the way things look you look Thank you for this time in your presence where we can give you the worth that is yours. And you are worthy of it all, Father. You are worthy of our very best. So, Lord, we come now to sit at our feet so we can hear from you so when we leave this place, Lord, we don't just leave as hearers, but we are aligned with you and will be doers of your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. about a father and a six-year-old son they went into a, a an old general store and there was a big barrel of candy there and the store manager saw the little six-year-old looking at that barrel of candy he was in a good mood so he said son why don't you go over to that barrel of candy reach down and however much candy you can get in your two hands you can have but the little boy got shy and he grabbed his father's leg and the store manager thought he frightened him. So he said, again, son, I'm serious. 
go over to the barrel of candy, reach down with your two hands, however much you, much you can get, you can have. But, but the, the, the boy was timid and shy, and the store manager was sort of uh, embarrassed or sad that he had scared the boy, frightened him. So he said, come on over here. And they walked over, and the store manager got down with his hands. He got two big hands of candy, put them in a bag, and gave them to the boy. And the boy just smiled ear to ear and said, thank you. When they got to the car, the dad was a little uh, confused. He said, son, uh, why were you so shy in there? Uh, when he asked you to reach down and grab that candy, I, I don't know, why didn't you do it? Why, why did you let him reach down in, with his hands and grab the candy? And the boy said, Dad, did you see how big his hands were? <laughs> well, friends, I want to say one thing from the outset. Everything you have comes from the hands of God. And God has big hands. If you have your Bible, turn with me to John chapter 11, beginning in verse 45. Pastor Randy set the stage. Do you give God your best? In chapters 11, verses 1 through 44, last week, we looked at the story of Lazarus. Do you remember that? We looked at the story of Lazarus, where Lazarus was a friend of Jesus, and he was sick. His sisters, Mary and Martha, sent word to Jesus, said, Jesus, your friend Lazarus is sick. But the Bible says Jesus stayed where he was two more days before even beginning the long journey back to Bethany where Lazarus was. When he finally returned, the sisters met him on the outskirts of Bethany. Mary, Martha came first and then Mary came. And Mary said, teacher, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. And she was moved with emotion. And the Bible says that Jesus loved Lazarus and Mary and Martha. And when he saw their pain, their mourning, because he had been dead for four days, Jesus wept. Some of the onlookers said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have prevented his friend from dying? And Jesus said, roll away the stone. And they rolled away the stone. He said, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus came out of the grave with the burial bandages still on him. It's a great story about one of the great miracles of the Bible. But today we're going to pick up with what happens after that, beginning in chapter 11, verse 45. Let me read verses 45 and 46. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Now, it was one of the greatest miracles anyone had ever seen. No one doubted that a miracle had taken place. Everyone there knew Lazarus. Everyone there knew that Lazarus was sick. Everyone there knew that Lazarus died. Every, most of them attended the funeral and knew he had been dead four days and saw him come out of the tomb still in the, the burial cloths right there. They saw the dead man who became alive. Now the purpose of this miracle was for Jesus to show that he is God. That's the purpose of the Gospel of John. You heard me say time and time again to show that Jesus Christ is not just a man, a prophet, or a great teacher or rabbi. He is the only begotten Son of God. He is God in flesh. He show us that he has the power over death. He has the ability to breathe life into a death body and bring us back to life. And though we die, we can yet still live because he is the resurrection and the life. Now, many people who saw that believed. Many people became followers of Christ. Why? Because they saw what Jesus did when he raised Lazarus from the dead. But not all. Some of them did not believe. They held on to their disbelief. And what did they do in verse 46? They ran to the Jewish leaders. They ran to the Pharisees and said, Do you know what happened at the home of Lazarus? There's something going on down there. Look at verses 47 and 48. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council together and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. So the Pharisees, 
the Jewish leaders, they called an emergency meeting to discuss the situation. Now, they had heard about the miracle, but they were sticking to their disbelief. They, the, the, the fact that Jesus, what was the Messiah, was not even a consideration, even though their own scriptures foretold that the Messiah would come, and, and Jesus was that Messiah, that they just did not even consider that a possibility. And they said, what are we going to do? Because many people are believing in him. If all the people follow him, we may lose our position and our power with Rome. Now, what's happening here is these Jewish leaders, these Pharisees, they were more concerned with keeping their position. They were more concerned with keeping their, 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 their place and their power and with Rome than they were seeing the coming kingdom of God and the Messiah. Even though all their lives they've been taught, prepare for the Messiah, await for the Messiah. But when they see him, they say, no, we like it the way we have it. We don't want him to be upsetting the apple cart here. We need to deal with this right now. Look at verses 49 through 54. But one of them... Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who were scattered abroad. So, from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim, and there he stayed with the disciples. Enter Caiaphas the high priest. Now, in the Old Testament, the high priest usually held office for life. It was a lifetime position. But under the rulership of Rome, the Romans appointed the high priest, and they always selected one who was friendly with Rome. And, and, and they would bribe him or, or, or reward him or smooth him so that the high priest was more concerned about pleasing Rome than leading the Jewish faithful right there. So, so Caiaphas knew that, that if more people started following Jesus and less people were following him, Rome may have no need for a high priest, have no need for the Jews. And so they said, we've got to get rid of this man lest he make us obsolete and Rome no longer longer wants to work with us anymore. So he said, it's better for one man to die to save all Judaism. It's better for one man to be put away to save our nation, Israel. Look at verses 55 through 57. Now, the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think, that he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so they might arrest him. Now, when the Passover came, uh, the people were, were, were gathering in Jerusalem. They came from all over for the Passover. And the talk on the street was, what do you think? Do you think Jesus is going to come? No, he's not going to come. There's a warrant out for his arrest. He's going to skip this one out. He had never missed the Passover. Sure, he's going to come. What do you think? What do you think? Everybody was talking. It was like wanted signs on the post office door saying, Jesus of Nazareth wanted. The, the word was out from the Jewish leaders. If you see Jesus, come tell us. The first person who sees him in Jerusalem, tell us quickly so that we can come and arrest him. Look at verse, chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary, therefore, took a pound of of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. So, 
six days before the Passover. Now, I don't know if this was a week after Lazarus died and was risen, or a month after, or a year. But now we're getting to the final week of the earthly life of Jesus. This six days before the Passover, the Passover when Jesus had his last supper with his disciples. So you're probably talking about the Saturday night before Jesus makes his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Are you with me? So it's probably the Saturday night before the final week in the earthly life of Jesus. And he doesn't go to Jerusalem, he goes to Bethany. Bethany is a village about two miles outside of Jerusalem, and he's invited by Lazarus to come to his house for dinner. <laughs> now, this wasn't just a, a quaint family dinner. This was a banquet given in honor of their Lord, a banquet giving in honor of the Lord Jesus Christ, a banquet to show praise and honor to the promised Messiah of God right there. So everyone is there, and, and, and Lazarus is the host. Mary and Martha, the sisters, are in charge of the preparations, preparing the meal and, serve, and, and serving the meal there. And Martha's preparing and preparing and preparing, and she looks up and she says, where's Mary? And Mary's nowhere to be found. Martha's a nervous wreck. She's a worry ward. Said, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Anybody know where Mary is? And lo and behold, do you know where Mary is? She's in there with the men. She's in there with the guys. She's sitting at the feet of Jesus. She'd got this big ointment of perfume and poured it out on the feet of Jesus and prostrated at his feet, wipes his feet with the perfume with her hair right there. Now, now Mar Martha is furious. There's so much work to be done. And there's Mary just coddling at the feet of Jesus. So everybody's there wondering why, why are they having a banquet? You see, isn't the word out? You should avoid Jesus? Isn't the word out that, that you should go tell, report it when you see Jesus? Uh, but that didn't faze Lazarus and Mary and Martha. They knew Jesus was not a criminal. They knew Jesus was not a troublemaker. They knew that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So they invited him. They could care less what the authorities said. They knew that Jesus had brought Lazarus back to life, and they were not going to be deterred. They were going to honor and praise and worship Jesus Christ as their Lord. And Mary, most of all, bows down at his feet and wipes his feet with expensive perfume. Verses 4, 5, and 6. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. I like those three words. But Judas Iscariot. But Judas Iscariot. But Judas Iscariot. It, it implies a stunned silence at what they see taking place with Mary and Jesus right there. You see, they were shocked at the scene. Shocked that a woman would come into the room with a man. Shocked that Mary would bow down at his feet. Shocked that she would pour perfume over his feet. Shocked that she would wipe his feet with her hair right there. But Judas Iscariot, it basically what it shows right here is a sharp contrast between the selflessness of Mary and the selfishness of Judas Iscariot. You see, you hear what Judas, why didn't you sell this perfume and give the money to the poor? That's what he said right there. He wasn't interested in the poor. He was the treasurer. He knew, wanted all the money in his control. He thought it was a waste when they could have gotten cash for this right there. But Jew, Jesus knew exactly what was going on. Look at what he says in verses 7 and 8. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. Now, what I want you to notice here, this was a, a, a praise for Mary, but a public rebuke of Judas Iscariot. I don't know the tone. Judas, leave her alone. Judas, back off. Judas, You'll always have the poor with you. 
Let her do what she came to do. And, and I don't know the heart and the motives, but I almost think that Judas, so proud, knowing that he is the one who would to, 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 to betray Jesus, I think he may have been so put out that it might have been then when he put in his, into motion his plan to betray his Lord, which he would do within a week right there. So J Jesus publicly rebukes Judas Iscariot and praises Mary for her good deeds. Now, well, why did he praise Mary? Because she gave her best. She gave the very best that she had right there. She did not know that Jesus would die in a week and she could use that, that for his burial. All she knew is that Jesus was her master, her Lord, the King of Kings, and she wanted to give her best and she didn't want to wait. How many times have you wanted to do something? And you said, I'm going to wait. And you wish you wouldn't have waited. You want to do it now. That's what Mary said. I'm not going to wait. I've got the opportunity. I've got the means. I've got it right here. Why? And what if she would have waited a week? Come on now. He'd have been gone. Friends, don't put off tomorrow what you can do today right here. She gave. Look at verses 9, 10, and 11. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. So when word got to the chief priests that Jesus was at the home of Lazarus, he said, What? Why is he there? Lazarus welcomed him to his home. And he said, yes, and Lazarus is telling everyone he's the Christ, he's the Messiah, they raised him from the dead. Well, put an arrest warrant out for him too. We gotta get rid of him, we gotta silence him because many people are believing on account of him. Week, the focus in 11, chapters one th chapter 11, verse one through 44, where the focus was on Lazarus, his friend of Jesus, how Jesus raised him from the dead. But today in chapter 12, I want you to see the focus is not so much on Lazarus, but on Mary. Mary rises to the front for to the front of our story, rises to the top, and when she, when she gives her very best to God. And it, she gave such a beautiful gift that this one gift is recorded in the Bible. Isn't that cool? Her gift is recorded in the Bible. Did you know it's recorded in Matthew, Mark, and John? Three of the four Gospels are so moved, impressed by the Mary giving her very best that he chose to, re to record it in their Gospel right there. It was a genuine display of love. Now, many people did not understand what Mary did, but Jesus understood. You see, Judas rebuked Mary, but Jesus revered her. The disciples were perplexed. But Jesus was pleased. Martha was horrified, uh, but Jesus was honored by the offering that she gave to him that day. So here's the question of the day. What kind of offering do you give to God? What do you give? Do you give your best to God? What kind of offering do you give to God? In the Old Testament, the Bible talks about a tithe. The word tithe means tenth. So the, in the Old Testament, they give 10% to, to the God. Bring the tithe to the storehouse, which is the church, the 10%. In the New Testament, it, it, the, they don't, it gets away from the tithe, and it says you know, everything belongs to God. Everything is God. Everything you have comes from the hands of God. So we're to give back to God that which he has given to us. And no, we don't own it all. God. God owns it all. Now, I teach for 40 years. I've taught a financial principle. And if you've heard me say this, and if you haven't heard it, write it down. It's called the 10-10-80 principle. Friends, it's changed our life for the last 40 years. The 10-10-80 principle is simply this. For every dollar you get, whether it be from your Social Security check or your job or inheritance, the first 10% goes to God. The second 10% goes for savings or a rainy day or emergency, and you adjust your lifestyle to live on 
It's a great principle. 10% to God, 10% to savings, and adjust your life to live on 80%. Friends, if you follow this principle, you'll do two things. First, you'll, you'll obey the scriptures. You'll honor God by giving him. Second, you will live within your means. And I think one of the greatest sins in our culture today are people living beyond their means. I was a pastor in Las Vegas for 18 years. I preached a sermon called The Biggest Sin in Las Vegas. And people said, oh, what is it? What is it? It was people living beyond their means. You see, because the average American does not live on 80% of their income, the average American lives on 118% of their income. And you wonder why we're always in debt. So the 10, 10, 80 principle, the first 10% to God, the second 10% to savings, and you live your life on 80%. Let me share with you from this text four life principles about giving a God-honoring offering. Four principles that you can know if your offering is honoring to God. Number one, a God-honoring offering is something that is precious to us. If you want to honor God with your giving, you give something that's very valuable to you and precious to you. For Mary, it was a very expensive bottle of perfume. Pure nard. It was worth 300 denarii. A denarii was a day's wage. So that's almost a year's salary. Now understand in Bible times, they didn't have banks. They didn't have savings and loans. They didn't have stocks and bonds. This was her life's savings. If she were to have a crisis, she would go sell some of her perfume get some money to go meet her needs. That was like her savings account right there. But when she sees Jesus, she says, what's the best I can give? What's the best I can give? She looks at this, her life savings, and she goes and, and, and she pours it out <coughs> on the feet of Jesus. And I don't know how much she poured out before she stopped, but, but, but she was pouring it. She wasn't dipping. She didn't dip her finger in it and touch Jesus and say, a little dab will do you. No, this wasn't dippity-doo, you know. This was per expensive perfume. And she pours it out on his feet right there because she wants to give it all, give it all to Jesus right there. It was of great value to her. You may know the story in the Old Testament. King David when he was going to buy the threshing floor for the, the property for the temple mount where the temple would be built, and he went to purchase it, and the seller said, I'll just give it to the Lord. It'll be my offering to the Lord. Do you remember what David said? Far be it from me to offer something to God that cost me nothing. You follow me? Far be it from me to offer something to God that cost me nothing right there. Uh, I went to a, a Promise Keepers event about 20 years ago. A, a true story. And you got, in a football stadium, 80,000 men. And, and the speaker was challenging us to give, to give. And why we don't give. He said, do something for me. Gentlemen, go down into your pocket and, and get your, your billfold and hold it up. So I got my billfold, I held it up. Everybody got it up? Okay, what I want you to do, that was easy. I want you to turn and give your billfold to the person to your right. Okay? <laughs> I couldn't let go. <laughs> I didn't know the person to my right. He wanted to give me my billfold. And, and, and the guy to my left went to my church. He was a very wealthy guy. He gave me his billfold. So now I'm handing, I'm holding somebody else's billfold. He said, all right, now we're going to take an offering. I want you to look into that billfold and give like you've always wanted to give. <laughs> Isn't it easy to give? when it doesn't cost you anything? Isn't it easy to give when you're giving somebody else's money like that? Oh, friends, I want to talk about giving sacrificially. Giving, what, what, when you first start tithing, if you've ever started tithing, it's not easy at first. It's a sacrifice. You've got to have faith. You've got to trust that God will meet your needs. And so, but, but it's in the sacrifice, it's in the trust that you see God's hand at work. An offering that honors God is when you give something that is of great value, that is precious to you. Number two, a God-honoring offering is pleasant to others. A God-honoring offering is pleasant to others. In verse three, it says, when Mary poured out that expensive perfume, the entire house was filled 
with the fragrance of the room. They didn't have signs, this is a fragrance-free room right here. No, that they loved the fragrance of the perfume. It was a sweet-smelling aroma right there. Everyone benefited. And the Apostle Paul, I believe it's in the book of Philippians, when he took an offering back, he said, your gift to the church was a sweet-smelling aroma to all who received it. You don't know, but when you give, you, you bless others. When you give, you enable us to, 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 to buy more donuts. You enable us to have more ministries, to reach out to the poor, to reach out to our community. When you give, other people, many people are blessed. My first church out of seminary, I was a youth minister, 1987, First Baptist Church of El Paso, Texas. It was a large downtown church, and uh, they have a, a calendar year budget by August this was 1990, 1990, they were $75,000 in the rears, in the red. That means they had spent $75,000 more than they had taken in. Suffice it to say, they didn't live by the 10, 10 80 principle, okay? And so I don't believe in this, and I don't, I said, I don't believe this, I said, I don't do this. They had something called a catch-up Sunday. And they asked the church on the second week in September if everyone would give, give, give to help us get back into the black. And in 1990, I believe it was, on that second Sunday in September, they took an offering and they collected $93,000 in 1990. And they said one anonymous gift was $50,000. And, and, and I'll never forget, chills went down my, my, my arms. People applauded this anonymous giver like that. And what I'm saying is this, even though he was anonymous, it was a blessing. A blessing to everyone. Why? Because the church could move forward. They could help their revival. They could keep the lights on. They could keep all the utilities. They could keep paying the staff. They, they could keep functioning as a church. When you give a, a, a God, an offering that honors God, others will be pleased, and it will be pleasant to many other people who are there. So that's when I talk about being pleasant to others. You know, when, when I say Offerings. You know, when I talk about the tithe, ten percent, and I know there's different views on this, but a lot of people. A guy came to me. He said, "Pastor, he said, I, I, I really want to help the families who are hurting in our church." He said, "I give my tithe, but I want to give my offering over and above that, and I want to uh, help hurting families in the church." And th this man had it right. Because this is, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but, but the Bible says the tithe goes to the storehouse. You give your tithe to the church, and you elect pastors and leadership teams to make a budget, and we determine where that money goes, that you trust us to do that. You, you, don't, you don't give your tithe and say, I want it to go here, I want it to go here, I want it to go here. Uh, so I say, uh, you know, how dare I tell God what to do with this money? You know, I, I, so I don't say, I don't give a tithe and say, it's got to go to here. And we got a lot of, but many times an offering is over and above your tithe that God will bless you, that you can bless ministries of our church. We've got many different great ministries. We've got a, a benevolence ministry, and, and, and we've got a, a, a missions ministry. We, we've got this back-to-school ministry there. We've got the music ministry, the singles ministry, the women's ministry. But those things are over and above your tithe to the church. And, and, and where, where, where you give over and above to those ministries and you don't tell God what to do with his money. And so when you do that over and above your giving, you can bless people. And it's pleasant to all of those around. So a God-honoring offering is, is, is precious to us. A God-honoring offering is pleasant to others. Number three, a God-honoring offering is perplexing to some. You know, and I know you've heard this if you're a giver. When you give, everybody doesn't understand. When, when, when you, you, sometimes your spouse doesn't understand why you want to tithe to the church. Uh, I, I have someone come to me, and, and they want to put out a will, and they've got three children, and they want to divide. This is very common. Uh, that they've got three children. They want to divide their inheritance in force, and they want to give one-fourth to each of the three children and one-fourth to the church. Well, all the children don't always like that, do they? Because we live in a, a greedy culture. You know, we want to get, 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 get all you can, can all you get, seal the lid and sit on the top. We always want to get what we can get out of it, you know. Non-believing accountants 
They, they, they think Christians are crazy. Well, you're giving that much to the church. Now with, with, the, with the minimum uh, uh, tax thing, we, it's hard to even get above that. You don't even get tax. You don't even get tax credit for these things anymore. Why do you give so much? I can put the mutual fund. It can make money over here. You see, a lot of people will not understand. Judas Iscariot didn't understand. Why in the world? What a waste. We could sell that. We get 300 denarii for that right there. That's what happened there. You see, hear me. But you don't give so that people will understand. You give to honor God. You don't give so that people will understand. You give out of obedience to God and to honor your God right there. And I believe this with all my heart. Your heart follows your money. Where you put your money is where you really love. Your heart, all the party, he does that. He wants to give to this candidate. And give, he'll give to candidates in states that he doesn't even live in to help this person go into over there, uh, here. And he just gives. You got to give to this. And I remember thinking, Billy Bob, that's not his name. If he gave a fraction to the kingdom of God, what he gave to the Republican Party, I and mean, we, we, we could renovate our facilities. You know, it, it's like, but, but see, you give where your heart is. That's where your heart is. Your heart follows your money. So a God-honoring offering is precious to us. A God-honoring offering is pleasant to others. A God-honoring offering is perplexing to some. And number four, a God-honoring offering is pleasing to Christ. I told uh, you that this story is told in the books of Matthew, Mark, and John. I love the account over in Matthew chapter 26, verse 10, when Jesus uh, was looking, he looked at Judas when Judas rebuked her, and they looked down at Mary at the offering that he was giving, and then in verse 10, Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. Mary will be forever remembered by what she gave. Not by what she did or all the hours she served or this, but the, by her display of love by giving her best to God. <clears throat> I think the same is true with us. I'm so thankful. I've got so many faithful servants here in town, in this room right here. <clears throat> but when it all is said and done, do you love God? How do you show your love for God? Will you give your best to God? What kind of offering is your best? Something that's valuable. Something that is precious to you. Something that is pleasant to others. Something that's perplexing to some. But an offering that is pleasing to Christ. Oh, my friends. Let Jesus look down on you and say, leave her alone, for she has done a beautiful thing. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are God and that we have the opportunity to give. And so many times we don't give when we have the opportunity and we miss that opportunity and it never comes again. I pray that we will so trust you <clears throat> that we will understand that you own everything and we are simply your stewards. We will hold loosely the things of this world and freely give to you by faith, trusting you to meet our needs. Father, help us to show our love by how we live and how we give. We pray this in that name which is above all names, the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Stand with me. I've never in my life asked you to give money, but I do ask you to be faithful stewards of the Word of God. You don't give because the church needs your money. You don't give because Jesus has a cash flow problem. God doesn't need your money. God needs your heart. It's an act of obedience and servitude that you recognize that God owns it all and everything you have comes from God. I pray this message has been a blessing to you. And some of you need to come and just give your life to God. Give your possessions to God. Let God know that you own my house. You own my children. You own all of my possessions. I, I give them to you, dear God, and I will manage them 
while they're in my care. If you'd like somebody to pray with you, I invite you to come to the, to the cross. Pastor Eddie is here. He would love to pray with you if you have a need. You come now as we sing. Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter. announcements and then we'll dismiss you reminder we're getting your pictures taken for your directory and then the celebration of life for Isabella Cherry a longtime member here will be this Thursday at 10 a.m. in Franklin Hall 
And we go now with our mission, giving him our very best, following Jesus, loving God, loving his church, and loving his world. Have a great evening, my friends. God bless. Take a drink and relieve the drive.